Kinds of Minds Towards an Understanding of Consciousness Written and read by Daniel Dennett Chapter 1 What Kinds of Minds Are There? Know Your Own Mind Can we ever really know what is going on in someone else's mind? Can a woman ever know what it is like to be a man? What experiences does a baby have during childbirth? What experiences, if any, does a fetus have in its mother's womb? And what of non-human minds? What do horses think about? Why aren't vultures nauseated by the rotting carcasses they eat? When a fish has a hook sticking through its lip, does it hurt the fish as much as it would hurt you if you had a hook sticking through your lip? Can spiders think, or are they just tiny robots mindlessly making their elegant webs? For that matter, why couldn't a robot, if it was fancy enough, be conscious? There are robots that can move around and manipulate things almost as adeptly as spiders. Could a more complicated robot feel pain and worry about its future, the way a person can? Or is there some unbridgeable chasm separating the robots and maybe the spiders and insects and other clever but mindless creatures, from those animals that have minds. Could it be that all animals except human beings are really mindless robots? René Descartes notoriously maintained this in the 17th century. Might he have been dead wrong? Could it be that all animals, and even plants, and even bacteria, have minds? Or, to swing to the other extreme, are we so sure that all human beings have minds? Maybe, to take the most extreme case of all, you are the only mind in the universe. Maybe everything else, including the apparent speaker of this tape, is a mere mindless machine. This strange idea first occurred to me when I was a young child, and perhaps it did to you as well. Roughly a third of my students claim that they, too, invented it on their own and mulled it over when they were children. They're often amused to learn that it's such a common philosophical hypothesis that it has a name, solipsism, from Latin for myself alone. Nobody ever takes solipsism seriously for long, as far as we know, but it does raise an important challenge. If we know that solipsism is silly, if we know that there are other minds, how do we know? What kind of minds are there, and how do we know? The first question is about what exists, about, in philosophical parlance, ontology. The second question is about our knowledge, about epistemology. We're not going to try to answer these two questions once and for all, but rather, in the next three hours or so, I will discuss why these questions have to be answered together. Philosophers often warn against confusing ontological questions with epistemological questions. What exists is one thing, they say. What we can know about it is something else. There may be things that are completely unknowable to us, so we must be careful not to treat the limits of our knowledge as sure guides to the limits of what there is. I agree that this is good general advice. But I will argue that we already know enough about minds to know that one of the things that makes them different from everything else in the universe is the way we know about them. For instance, you know you have a mind and you know you have a brain, but these are different kinds of knowledge. You know you have a brain the way you know you have a spleen by hearsay. You've never seen your spleen or your brain, I would bet. But since the textbooks tell you that all normal human beings have one of each, you conclude that you almost certainly have one of each as well. You are more intimately acquainted with your mind, so intimately that you might even say that you are your mind. That's what Descartes said. He said he was a mind, a race cogitans, or a thinking thing. A book or a teacher might tell you what a mind is, but you wouldn't have to take anybody's word for the claim that you had one. If it occurred to you to wonder whether you were normal and had a mind as other people do, you would immediately realize, as Descartes pointed out, that your very wondering this wonder demonstrated beyond all doubt that you did indeed have a mind. This suggests that each of us knows exactly one mind from the inside, and no two of us know the same mind from the inside. No other kind of thing is known about in that way. And yet, this whole discussion so far has been conducted in terms of how we know, you and I, it presupposes that solipsism is false. The more we, we, 
reflect on this presupposition, the more unavoidable it appears. There couldn't be just one mind, or at least not just one mind like our minds. We mind-havers, we minders. If we want to consider the question of whether non-human animals have minds, we have to start by asking whether they have minds in some regards like ours, since these are the only minds we know anything about at this point. Try asking yourself whether non-human animals have flurbs, you can't even know what the question is if you don't know what a flurb is supposed to be. Whatever else a mind is, it is supposed to be something like our minds, otherwise we wouldn't call it a mind. So our minds, the only minds we know from the outset, are the standard with which we must begin. Without this agreement, we'll just be fooling ourselves, talking rubbish without knowing it. When I address you, I include us both in the class of mind-havers. This unavoidable starting point creates or acknowledges an in-group, a class of privileged characters that set off against everything else in the universe. This is almost too obvious to notice, since it is so deeply enshrined in our thinking and talking, but I must dwell on it. When there's a we, you are not alone. Solipsism is false. There's company present. This comes out particularly clearly if we consider some curious variations. We left Houston at dawn, heading down the road, just me and my truck. Strange. If this fellow thinks his truck is such a worthy companion that it deserves shelter under the umbrella of we, he must be very lonely. Either that or his truck must have been customized in ways that would be the envy of roboticists everywhere. In contrast, we, just me and my dog, doesn't startle us at all. But we, just me and my oyster is hard to take seriously. In other words, we're pretty sure that dogs have minds and we're dubious that oysters do. Membership in the class of things that have minds provides an all-important guarantee, the guarantee of a certain sort of moral standing. Only mind-havers can care. Only mind-havers can mind what happens. If I do something to you that you don't want me to do, this has moral significance. It matters because it matters to you. It may not matter much, or your interests may be overridden for all sorts of reasons. Or, if I'm punishing you justly for a misdeed of yours, the fact that you care may actually count in favor of my deed. In any event, your caring automatically counts for something in the moral equation. If flowers have minds, then what we do to flowers can matter to them, and not just to those who care about what happens to flowers. If nobody cares, then it doesn't matter what happens to flowers. There are some who would disagree. They would insist that the flowers had some moral standing, even if nothing with a mind knew of or cared about their existence. Their beauty, for instance, no matter how unappreciated, is a good thing in itself, and hence should not be destroyed, other things being equal. Now, this is not the view that the beauty of these flowers matters to God, for instance, or that it might matter to some being whose presence is undetectable by us. It is the view that the beauty matters even though it matters to no one, not to the flowers themselves and not to God or anybody else. I remain unpersuaded, but rather than dismiss this view outright, I will note that it is controversial and not widely shared. In contrast, it takes no special pleading at all to get most people to agree that something with a mind has interests that matter. That's why people are so concerned morally about the question of what has a mind. Any proposed adjustment in the boundary of the class of mind-havers has major ethical significance. We might make mistakes. We might endow mindless things with minds, or we might ignore a mindful thing in our midst. These mistakes would not be equal. To over-attribute minds, to make friends with your houseplants, or lie awake at night worrying about the welfare of the computer asleep on your desk, is, at worst, a silly error of credulity. To under-attribute minds, to disregard or discount or deny the experience, the suffering and joy, the thwarted ambitions and frustrated desires of a mind-having person or animal would be a terrible sin. After all, how would you feel if you were treated as an inanimate object? 
Notice, by the way, how this rhetorical question appeals to our shared status as mind-havers. In fact, both errors could have serious moral consequences. If we over-attributed minds, if, for instance, we got it into our heads that since bacteria had minds, we couldn't justify killing them, this might lead us to sacrifice the interests of many legitimate interest holders, our friends, our pets, ourselves, for nothing of genuine moral importance. The abortion debate hinges on just such a quandary. Some think it's obvious that a ten-week-old fetus has a mind, and others think it's obvious that it does not. If it does not, then the path is open to argue that it has no more interests than, say, a gangrenous leg or an abscessed tooth. It can be destroyed to save the life or just to suit the interests of the mind-haver of which it is a part. If it does already have a mind, then whatever we decide, we obviously have to consider its interests along with the interests of its temporary host. In between these extreme positions lies the real quandary. The fetus will soon develop a mind if left undisturbed, so when do we start counting its prospective interests? The relevance of mind-having to the question of moral standing is especially clear in these cases. Since if the fetus in question is known to be anencephalic, lacking a brain, this dramatically changes the issue for most people, not for all. I'm not attempting to settle these moral issues here, but just to show how a common moral opinion amplifies our interest in these questions way beyond normal curiosity. The requirements of morality and scientific method pull in opposite directions here. The ethical course is to err on the side of over-attribution, just to be safe. The scientific course is to put the burden of proof on the attribution. As a scientist, you can't just declare, for instance, that the presence of glutamate molecules, the basic neurotransmitter involved in signaling between nerve cells, amounts to the presence of mind. You have to prove it against a background in which the null hypothesis is that mind is not present. Innocent until proven guilty is the null hypothesis in our criminal law. There is substantial disagreement among scientists about which species have which sorts of minds. But even those scientists who are the most ardent champions of consciousness in animals accept this burden of proof and think they can meet it by devising and confirming theories that show which animals are conscious. But no such theories are yet confirmed, and in the meantime we can appreciate the discomfort of those who see this agnostic wait-and-see policy as jeopardizing the moral status of creatures they are sure are conscious. Suppose the question before us were not about the minds of pigeons or bats, but about the minds of left-handed people or people with red hair. We would be deeply offended to be told that it had yet to be proved that this category of living thing had the wherewithal for entry into the privileged class of mind-havers. Many people are similarly outraged by the demand for proof of mind-having in non-human species. But if they're honest with themselves, they will grant that they, too, see the need for such proof in the case of, say, jellyfish or amoebas or daisies. So we agree on the principle, and they're just taking umbrage at its application to creatures so very much like us. We can allay their misgivings somewhat by agreeing that we should err well on the side of inclusiveness in all our policies until the facts are in. All the same, the price you must pay for scientific confirmation of your favorite hypothesis about animal minds is the risk of scientific disconfirmation. Words and Minds It is beyond serious dispute, however, that you and I each have a mind. How do I know you have a mind? Because anybody who can understand my words is automatically addressed by my pronoun, you. And only things with minds can understand. There are computer-driven devices that can read books for the blind. They convert a page of visible text into a stream of audible words, but they don't understand the words they read and hence are not addressed by any you they encounter. It passes right through them and addresses whoever listens to and understands the stream of spoken words. That's how I know that you, gentle listener, have a mind. So do I. Take my word for it. In fact, that's what we routinely do. We take each other's words as settling beyond any reasonable doubt the question of whether we each have minds. Why should words be so convincing? 
because they are such powerful resolvers of doubts and ambiguities. You see somebody coming towards you, scowling and waving an axe. You wonder, what's his problem? Is he going to attack me? Is he mistaking me for somebody else? Ask him. Perhaps he will confirm your worst fears. Or perhaps he will tell you he's given up trying to unlock his car, which you're standing in front of, and has returned with his axe to break the window. You may not believe him when he says it's his car, not somebody else's, but further conversation, if you decide not to run away, is bound to resolve your doubts and clarify the situation in ways that would be all but impossible if you and he were unable to communicate verbally. Suppose you try asking him, but it turns out that he doesn't speak your language. Perhaps you will then both resort to gestures and miming. These techniques, used with ingenuity, will take you far, but they're a poor substitute for language. Just reflect on how eagerly you would both seek to confirm your hard-won understanding if a bilingual interpreter were to come along. A few relayed questions and answers would not just allay any residual uncertainty, but would add details that could not be conveyed in any other way. When he saw you put one hand on your chest and push out with your other hand, he thought you meant you were ill. He was trying to ask if you wanted him to take you to a doctor once he'd broken the window and retrieved his keys. That business with his fingers in his ears was his attempt to convey a stethoscope. Ah, it all falls into place now, thanks to a few words. People often emphasize the difficulty of accurate and reliable translation between human languages. Human cultures, we are told, are too different, too incommensurable, to permit the meanings available to one speaker to be perfectly shared with another. No doubt translation always falls somewhat short of perfection, but this may not matter much in the larger scheme of things. Perfect translation may be impossible, but good translation is achieved every day, routinely, in fact. Good translation can be objectively distinguished from not-so-good translation and from bad translation, and it permits all human beings, regardless of race, culture, age, gender, or experience, to unite more closely with one another than individuals of any other species can. We human beings share a subjective world, and know that we do, in a way that is entirely beyond the capacities of any other creatures on the planet, because we can talk to one another. Human beings who don't yet have a language in which to communicate are the exception, and that's why we have a particular problem figuring out what it's like to be a newborn baby or a deaf mute. Conversation unites us. We can all know a great deal about what it's like to be a Norwegian fisherman or a Nigerian taxi driver, an 80-year-old nun or a 5-year-old boy blind from birth, a chess master or a prostitute or a fighter pilot. We can know much more about these topics than we can know about what it's like, if anything, to be a dolphin, a bat, or even a chimpanzee. No matter how different from one another we people are, scattered around the globe, we can explore our differences and communicate about them. No matter how similar to one another wildebeests are, standing shoulder to shoulder in a herd, they cannot know much of anything about their similarities, let alone their differences. They cannot compare notes. They can have similar experiences side by side, but they really cannot share experiences the way we do. Some of you may doubt this. Can't animals instinctively understand each other in ways we human beings cannot fathom? Certainly some authors have said so. Consider, for instance, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, who imagines in her 1993 book, The Hidden Life of Dogs, that dogs enjoy a wise understanding of their own ways. One example. For reasons known to dogs, but not to us, Many dog mothers won't mate with their sons. Their instinctive resistance to such inbreeding is not in doubt. But what gives her the idea that dogs have any more insight into the reasons for their instincts than we have into ours? There are many things we feel strongly and instinctively disinclined to do with no inkling about why we feel that way. To suppose without proof that dogs have more insight into their urges than we do is to ignore the null hypothesis in an unacceptable way, if we are asking a scientific question. As we shall see, very simple organisms may be attuned to their environments and to each other in strikingly apt ways without having the slightest appreciation of their attunement. 
We already know from conversation, however, that people are typically capable of a very high order of understanding of themselves and others. Of course, we can be fooled. People often emphasize the difficulty of determining whether a speaker is sincere. Words, by being the most powerful tools of communication, are also the most powerful tools of deception and manipulation. But while it may be easy to lie, it's almost as easy to catch a liar, especially when the lies get large and the logistical problem of maintaining the structure of falsehood overwhelms the liar. In fantasy, we can conjure up infinitely powerful deceivers, but the deceptions that are possible in principle to such an evil demon can be safely ignored in the real world. It would be just too difficult to make up that much falsehood and maintain it consistently. We know that people the world over have much the same likes and dislikes, hopes and fears. We know that they enjoy recollecting favorite events in their lives. We know that they all have rich episodes of waking fantasy in which they rearrange and revise the details deliberately. We know that they have obsessions, nightmares, and hallucinations. We know that they can be reminded by an aroma or a melody of a specific event in their lives, and that they often talk to themselves silently without moving their lips. Long before there was scientific psychology, long before there was meticulous observation of and experimentation on human subjects, this was all common knowledge. We have known these facts about people since ancient times because we have talked it over with them at great length. We know nothing comparable about the mental lives of any other species because we can't talk it over with them. We may think we know, but it takes scientific investigation to confirm or refute our traditional hunches. The Problem of Incommunicative Minds It's very hard to tell what somebody is thinking who won't discuss it or who can't for one reason or another. But we normally suppose that such incommunicative folks are indeed thinking that they do have minds, even if we can't confirm the details. This much is obvious, if only because we can readily imagine ourselves in a situation in which we would steadfastly refuse to communicate, all the while thinking our private thoughts, perhaps reflecting with amusement on the difficulties that observers were having in figuring out what, if anything, was going on in our minds. Talking no matter how conclusive its presence may be, is not necessary for having a mind. From this obvious fact, we attempted to draw a problematic conclusion. There could be entities who do have minds, but who cannot tell us what they're thinking, not because they're paralyzed or suffering from aphasia, the inability to communicate verbally due to localized brain damage, but because they have no capacity for language at all. Now, why do I say this is a problematic conclusion? First, let's consider the case to be made in its favor. Surely, tradition and common sense declare that there are minds without language. Surely, our ability to discuss with others what is going on in our minds is just a peripheral talent, in the sense in which one speaks of a computer's laser printer as a peripheral device. The computer can go right on computing without a printer attached. Surely, non-human animals, at least some of them, have mental lives. Surely, human infants, before they acquire language, and human deaf-mutes, even those rare deaf-mutes who have never acquired even sign language, have minds. Surely. These minds may doubtless differ in many hard-to-fathom ways from our minds, the minds of those who can understand a conversation such as this, but surely they are minds. Our royal road to the knowledge of other minds, language, does not extend to them, but this is just a limitation on our knowledge, not a limitation on their minds. The prospect arises, then, that there are minds whose contents are systematically inaccessible to our curiosity, unknowable, uncheckable, impenetrable by any investigation. The traditional response to this prospect is to embrace it. Yes, indeed, minds are the ultimate terra incognita, beyond the reach of all science, and, in the case of languageless minds, beyond all empathetic conversation as well. So what? A little humility ought to temper our curiosity. Don't confuse ontological questions about what exists with epistemological questions about how we know about it. We must grow comfortable with this wonderful fact about what is off-limits to inquiry. But before we get comfortable with this conclusion, we need to consider the implications of some other facts about our own case that are just as obvious. 
we find that we often do clever things without thinking at all. We do them automatically or unconsciously. What is it like, for instance, to use information about the optic flow of shapes in peripheral vision to adjust the length of your stride as you walk across rough terrain? The answer is it isn't like anything. You can't pay attention to this process even if you try. What is it like to notice, while sound asleep, that your left arm has become twisted into a position in which it is putting undue strain on your left shoulder? Like nothing, it is not part of your experience. You swiftly and unconsciously shift to a more comfortable position without any interruption of your sleep. If we are asked to discuss these putative parts of our mental lives, we draw a blank. Whatever happened in us to govern these clever behaviors wasn't a part of our mental lives at all. So another prospect to consider is that among the creatures who lack language, there are some that do not have minds at all, but do everything automatically or unconsciously. The traditional response to this prospect, too, is to embrace it. Yes, indeed, some creatures entirely lack minds. Surely bacteria are mindless, and so probably are amoebas and starfish, quite possibly even ants, for all their clever activity, are mere mindless automata, trundling about in the world without the slightest experience of thought. What about trout? What about chickens? What about rats? We may never be able to tell where to draw the line between those creatures that have minds and those that do not, but this is just another aspect of the unavoidable limitations on our knowledge. Such facts may be systematically unknowable, not just hard to uncover. Here, then, are two sorts of supposedly unknowable facts. Facts about what is going on in those who have minds but no way of talking about their thoughts. And facts about which creatures have minds at all. These two varieties of off-limits ignorance are not equally easy to accept. The differences between minds might be differences whose major outlines were readily discernible to objective observers, but whose minor details became harder and harder to determine, a case of diminishing returns for labor invested. The unknown leftovers would not be mysteries, but just inevitable gaps in a richly informative but finite catalog of similarities and differences. The differences between minds would then be like the differences between languages or styles of music or art, inexhaustible in the limit, but approachable to any degree of approximation you like. But the difference between having a mind and not having a mind at all, between being something with its own subjective point of view and being something that is all outside and no inside, like a rock or a discarded sliver of fingernail, is apparently an all-or-nothing difference. It is much harder to accept the idea that no amount of further investigation will ever tell us whether there is anyone there to care inside a lobster's shell, for instance, or behind the shiny facade of a robot. The suggestion that such a morally important sort of fact could be systematically unknowable by us is simply intolerable. It means that no matter what investigations we conducted, we might, for all we could know, be sacrificing the genuine moral interests of some for the entirely illusory benefit of mindless others. Unavoidable ignorance of the consequences is often a legitimate excuse when we find we have unwittingly produced some harm in the world. But if we must declare ourselves at the outset to be unavoidably ignorant of the very basis of all moral thinking, morality becomes a sham. Fortunately, this conclusion is as incredible as it is intolerable. The claim that, say, left-handed people are unconscious zombies that may be dismantled as if they were bicycles is preposterous. So, at the other extreme, is the claim that bacteria suffer, or that carrots mind being plucked unceremoniously from their earthy homes. Obviously, we can know to a moral certainty, which is all that matters, that some things have minds and other things don't. But we don't yet know how we know these facts. The strength of our intuitions about such cases is no guarantee of their reliability. Consider a few cases beginning with the remark by the evolutionist Elaine Morgan in her 1995 book, The Descent of the Child. The hard-stopping thing about the newborn is that from minute one there is somebody there. Anyone who bends over the cot and gazes at it is being gazed back at. 
As an observation about how we human observers instinctively react to eye contact, this is right on target. But it thereby shows how easily we can be misled. We can be fooled by a robot, for instance. At the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, Rodney Brooks and Lynn Andrea Stein have assembled a team of roboticists and others, myself included, to build a humanoid robot named COG. COG is made of metal and silicon and glass, like other robots, but the design is so different, so much more like the design of a human being, that COG may someday become the world's first conscious robot. Is a conscious robot possible? I have defended a theory of consciousness, the multiple drafts model of 1991, that implies that a conscious robot is possible in principle, and COG is being designed with that distant goal in mind. But COG is nowhere near being conscious yet. COG cannot yet see or hear or feel at all, but its bodily parts can already move in unnervingly humanoid ways. Its eyes are tiny video cameras, which saccade, dart, to focus on any person who enters the room, and then track that person as he or she moves. Being tracked in this way is an oddly unsettling experience, even for those in the know. Staring into Cog's eyes while Cog stares mindlessly back can be quite heart-stopping to the uninitiated. But there's nobody there, not yet, in any case. Cog's arms, unlike those of standard robots, both real and cinematic, move swiftly and flexibly like your arms. When you press on Cog's extended arm, it responds with an uncannily humanoid resistance that makes you want to exclaim in stock horror movie fashion, It's alive! It's alive! It isn't, but the intuition to the contrary is potent. While we're imagining arms, let's consider a variation with a different moral. A man's arm has been cut off in a terrible accident, but the surgeons think they can reattach it. While it is lying there, still soft and warm, on the operating table, does it feel pain? If so, we should inject some Novocaine into it, especially if we plan to use a scalpel to cut back any tissue on the amputated arm before attempting the reunion. A silly suggestion, you reply. It takes a mind to feel pain, and as long as the arm is not attached to a body with a mind, whatever you do to the arm can't cause suffering in any mind. But perhaps the arm has a mind of its own. Perhaps it has always had one, but has just been unable to talk to us about it. Well, why not? It does have a substantial number of nerve cells in it still firing away. If we found a whole organism with that many active nerve cells in it, we would be strongly inclined to suppose that it was capable of experiencing pain, even if it couldn't express itself in terms we could understand. Here intuitions collide. Arms don't have minds, in spite of containing plenty of the processes and materials that tend to persuade us that some non-human animals do have minds. Is it behavior that counts? Suppose you pinched the thumb of the amputated arm and it pinched you back. Would you then decide to give it Novocaine? If not, why not? Because its reaction would have to be an automatic reflex? How can you be so sure? Is it something about the organization of those nerve cells that makes the difference? These puzzle cases are fun to think about, and we learn important facts about our naive concepts of mind when we try to figure out why our intuitions line up the way they do. But there must be a better way of investigating kinds of minds and non-minds that might fool us. The defeatist conviction that we will never know should be postponed indefinitely, saved as a last gasp conclusion to be reached only after we've actually exhausted all other avenues and not just imagined doing so. There may be surprises and illuminations awaiting us. One prospect to consider whether or not in the end we rule it out is that perhaps language is not so peripheral to minds after all. Perhaps the kind of mind you get when you add language to it is so different from the kind of mind you can have without language that calling them both minds is a mistake. Perhaps, in other words, our sense that there are riches in the minds of other creatures, riches inaccessible to us, but not, of course, to them, is an illusion. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein famously said, If a lion could talk, we could not understand him. 
That's one possibility, no doubt, but it diverts our attention from another possibility. If a lion could talk, we could understand him just fine, with the usual sorts of effort required for translation between different languages. But our conversations with him would tell us next to nothing about the minds of ordinary lions, since his language-equipped mind would be so different. It might be that adding language to a lion's mind would be giving him a mind for the first time, or it might not. In either case, we should investigate the prospect and not just assume with tradition that the minds of non-speaking animals are really rather like ours. If we are to find some alternative path of investigation, instead of just relying uncritically on our pre-theoretical intuitions, how might we begin? Let's consider the historical evolutionary path. There haven't always been minds. We have minds, but we haven't existed forever. We evolved from beings with simpler minds, if minds they were, who evolved from beings with still simpler candidates for minds. And there was a time, four or five billion years ago, when there weren't any minds at all, simple or complex, at least not on this planet. Which innovations occurred in what order, and why? The major steps are clear, even if the details about dates and places can be only speculative. Once we've told that story, we will at least have a framework in which to try to place our quandaries. Perhaps we will want to distinguish classes of pseudo-minds, or proto-minds, or semi-minds, or hemi-semi-demi-minds from the real thing. Whatever we decide to call these ancestral arrangements, perhaps we can agree upon a scale on which they mount, and the conditions and principles that created the scale in the first place. The next section develops some tools for this investigation. This investigation. This investigation. This investigation. This investigation. This investigation.